Well, this is depressing. The prisoner thought as she was marched through the steel hallway. The underground facility was large and surprisingly sterile, but largely devoid of personnel for some unknown reason. The prisoner had been seeing the same handful of guards every time a bowl of wet dog food was shoved under her door, or when her cell was opened up for her to be hosed down. She was stripped, shaved, beaten, and subjected to interrogation after pointless interrogation. All because of that one job. All because of Ubermensch. She was once a journalist, or something much like it. Now she was nothing more than a body waiting to be killed. Those are the thoughts which raced through her mind as she was marched to what would likely be her execution. She didn't care about the scars on her body, or the two guards who forced her along. As of now, she had only one goal, and that was to survive long enough to gain some form of truth. Even if she took it to her grave, that would be victory enough for her. Her captors had done everything possible to strip her of dignity, but she could still keep her sense of self if she could just gain a little more knowledge before she lost it all. The prisoner showed none of her defiant attitude outwards, though. She was silent, sullen, and defeated, or so she would have her captors believe. The funeral procession finally reached the end of the hallway, and the prisoner was forced into a room. The first thing she noticed was how normal it all looked. Furniture, appliances, and decorations were arranged in such a way that it appeared like a normal living room. The only thing odd about it was the room's inhabitants. There were many large dogs, as well as a couple of massive green insects. They looked like praying mantises, but horribly mutated and twisted so as to give their bodies more strength and agility. They rested together on a shelf that was built into the wall behind a barrier of glass. Something was horribly wrong. The guards didn't follow the prisoner in with her. Instead, they closed the heavy door behind her. The prisoner's instincts finally began to catch up with her ambition. She went up to one of the dogs, a massive Great Dane. He happily accepted a pat on the head and licked her hand. The prisoner noticed that he had no eyes and stroked his face out of a loving sense of pity. Suddenly he began to growl. Some of the dogs joined in. Others whimpered and buried their heads in their paws. Something is coming, the prisoner thought but she couldn't tell what. She knew dogs reacted to earthquakes, but there weren't any fault lines near the city she was basing her investigation in. She was almost lost in thought when her eyes detected a hint of movement. A table in the center of the room was starting to shake. She looked a little closer. Was it floating? With her non-dominant hand, she grabbed the edge of the table. The prisoner effortlessly lifted it high over her head. This was too much for her to take, and she let out a soft whimper of fear. The dogs all took notice of this and turned to face her with bared teeth. The prisoner was stunned. They had been so friendly before, why did they approach so menacingly now? That is what the prisoner might have thought if her instincts didn't take over. One of the largest dogs lunged at her, soaring through the air longer than gravity should permit directly at her throat. By the time it would have reached her, the prisoner had sidestepped a full meter away. The motion of this reflex sent her into the air, and she floated gently into a wall. Meanwhile, the other dogs had jumped on the one who lunged first, and were tearing each other apart in a brutal free-for-all. The prisoner slowly floated away from the bloodshed, watching in horror as living creatures were quickly butchered into small cutlets. Blood and viscera flew everywhere. 
the only dog left standing, or rather floating, was the Great Dane. It was badly wounded and its mouth was full of other dogs' flesh. Well, that was horrific, that Great Dane. Something must really be messing with the poor thing's head, the prisoner thought. But maybe if I stay quiet he won't be able to perceive me? One thing sure, I can survive long enough to learn something else. And so the prisoner floated and thought. The wounded Great Dane was slow, and its blood leaked out from several wounds. Still, that wasn't enough to stop the beast. With whatever agitation had overcome it in the first place, it still hunted for something to sink its teeth into. So did the prisoner move, quietly and gently pushing herself off of walls and debris to avoid the great beast. She knew she couldn't keep it up forever, so she began to formulate a plan in her mind. The bugs were still watching. In fact, their posture hadn't even changed in the hours that this torture had carried on for. That gave the prisoner an idea. Slowly but silently, she nudged the table to the opposite corner of the room. It was time. Positioning herself just right within the floating carnage, she lined herself and the table up like a bullet. The gun fired. The prisoner's body shot forth, propelling the table through the air with all the strength her tired legs could muster. With flawless precision, she slammed the table right into the glass shelf with the two bugs. The glass cracked, but didn't quite break. Both of the insectoids jumped back, and one even seemed to faint. As the unwillfully weaponized Great Dane launched itself toward the prisoner and tore her to shreds, she found herself overcome by one final thought. They can feel fear. In that, she found her victory. I felt my bones ache as I woke up to cold drafts and the dim light of the morning sun hiding behind a rain cloud. My life was a slow, simple one for now. I pulled myself out of bed and, with one eye open, I searched my pantry. Cereal was the only thing that looked particularly edible. One peek in the fridge and my hopes were dashed. No milk. I scratched my weary head and... After a few minutes, I came up with a plan. Sticky Joe's hot dog stand should be open around now. I can get myself some breakfast there. I dropped my bathrobe and put on some more conventional clothes. I'd still need to come back and change into my work uniform, but the tight pants and collared shirt only made me feel worse about my body, which was already too scrawny to really do much with. I wanted to get better. I really did. Still, my job wore me out too much to do anything else. Oh, well. Such complaints are useless when I've got nobody who cares enough to hear them. At least Sticky Joe would fill my belly. As I rode the elevator down from the fourth floor, I noticed something strange. I often felt the slight weightlessness and drop from the apparatus, but it was much more pronounced today. I sighed, knowing that my idiotic landlord probably wouldn't get it fixed until someone died in that little metal cage. Well, it wasn't me and it wasn't today, so I could celebrate that at least. Sticky Joe was something of a nomad, but I knew about where he'd be. It was a Sunday, and he always spent his mornings on street corners near churches, waiting for the congregation to disperse. Luckily, I found him at the nearest church, three blocks away from my apartment. What'll it be? I told him, only stopping to realize my awkwardness three seconds later. Sticky Joe laughed and said, Don't worry, I remember your usual order. Feeling a little sleepy today, are ya? I nodded and he continued, Don't worry about it. 
You don't stink like some of the junkies I end up feeding, so I don't mind if you talk like one from time to time. Just don't make it a habit, okay? I was relieved that my humiliating episode wouldn't permanently stain my reputation. Thanks, Joe. You're a real one. I noticed something odd as Sticky Joe threw my hot dog together. His movements were... unwieldy, like he was using too much force with each movement. Joe seemed to pick up on it as well, and very slowly picked up a bun with two fingers. He released it. But it stayed in place. The bun was fully levitating. I considered that maybe Sticky Joe was trying to pull a magic trick, but his panic shriek ruined that theory. Sticky Joe leapt back and soared into the air. Run! Save yourself while you still can! I wondered if running might propel me skyward as well, but something else caught my attention. It was raining a second ago, but the drop seemed to have stopped midair. I turned back to Sticky Joe, only to see him impaled on a flagpole. He screamed and writhed, like a spider that was flipped on its back. I wanted to run. I really did. But upon seeing someone I know in such a position, the real weight of the situation began to kick in. I stood there, despair creeping in. Sticky Joe was dead. And though I couldn't see the source of my danger, I felt that my life was already over. That's when I heard the most horrific sound I had ever experienced. Some form of massive weapon was fired, and I saw the target before I heard the explosion. A building up close to me exploded in a burst of rubble. My adrenaline outweighed my paralysis and my feet sprung into action. I turned and attempted to run but my first step sent me flying. I was lucky the area was so densely urban, I quickly landed on the side of a skyscraper. It was slick from the rainwater, and I began to slide along the glass panels. I realized that if I slid off the roof, I'd be trapped midair. Desperately, I tried to grab onto something, anything to stop me from flying away. I was in luck, a window had been left open. I grabbed the sill, and the action propelled me inside the apartment. I was immediately met with a horrifying sight. Some poor woman had knocked over her knife block in the other room, and... Well, I hoped I'd survive long enough to have nightmares about it. The empty room was an advantage I couldn't afford to waste, though. I knew I had to ascertain the threat before I could proceed with either running or fighting it. I pulled myself to the window carefully poking only my head out. The city seemed mostly normal except for one thing. There was a large crystalline shape floating above the city square, about ten blocks away. It would have been cleared to the point of invisibility, but the raindrops had revealed its presence. I saw a flash of light and heard that same unnatural explosion. A nearby building crumbled, along with three behind it, and I could almost pick up on a trail. The weapon seemed to be a high-velocity projectile, like a railgun. My heart sank as I realized the implications of this. Such a powerful weapon would probably be able to hit me from over the horizon, much less take out everything in my general direction. I would have to close the distance and fight for my life, even against whatever that crystalline gunner was. I had a decent plan of action. A large knife from the apartment was tucked into my belt after I wiped most of the viscera off. I would try to sneak as close to the crystal as possible, and when it noticed me, I would have to dance between the skyscrapers and then attack it. I considered it to be either some sort of machine like a gunship, or it was a single organism. If it was a life form of its own, I was already dead. If it was a ship, I could at least try to assassinate whatever was piloting it. It's weird, actually. I wondered for a second why I was able to make such a daring offensive. I wasn't that brave, and I didn't actively want to die. I suppose, if anything, 
It was that I was currently useless. I've got no people to look after, no loved ones at home. I studied long and hard in the hopes that I could one day make something of myself, but such potential had yet to be realized. My resources, my body, they were all meaningless unless I somehow did something with them. I felt a twinge of something. Was it sadness or anger? I didn't know. I didn't really feel much in the way of emotion anymore, so this sensation took me by surprise. It was a gentle warmth, like soft hands caressing every inch of my body. Was this love? I had read a couple of romance novels that described love in more flowery ways, but this felt closer to those descriptions than simple happiness or anger. With that thought, an indignant flame burned in my chest, and I began to speak to myself. What does love have to do with any of this? Am I supposed to faint with soft-minded joy at the thought of my death? Like I'm some schoolgirl who just wrote a letter to her crush? Am I supposed to seal my fate with a kiss, so I can meet the woman of my dreams and be together with her forever? Just be a good boy and take a railgun shot or two first, huh? I'm supposed to just let whatever cheese-brained mass murderer is behind all this do whatever they want to my body and mind alike? Until I have no scraps of dignity left with which to call myself human? Damn it. <sighs> this sensation was even more alien to me than love, but I knew that it was a pure, almost perfect rage. I thought of bar brawls, machismo, and the futility of such aimless destruction. I would have to be more elegant than that. The anger faded away, and I instantly returned to perfect emotionless serenity. Now that I was at my finest, I could begin my work. I slowly swung my body all the way out the window, and pulled myself down the building. It took a lot of time as I was still unaccustomed to the lack of gravity, but I made it to the road. From there it was a slow, stealthy crawl. It was like climbing a cliff face, but the threat of falling came from all directions. I had considered simply catapulting myself along the road, but corpses and debris alike blocked my path, and I wouldn't have a defined stopping point either. I stuck to my patience and it paid off. By embracing attrition, I was able to sneak six blocks closer to my enemy before it all fell apart. As I grew closer and closer, I noticed that the railgun hadn't fired in a while. This realization hit me like a lightning bolt when I heard that foul weapon charging up once again. Without the time to stop and think, my body moved for me. I leapt up and to my right, slamming into a gargoyle. I wrapped my body around it just in time. A horrendous explosion rocked the air around me, and I was pelted with chunks of stone. The gunner had detected me, and if I wasn't so quick I may have almost taken a direct hit from that thing. I knew I would have to dance and fly in order to survive. Humans are meant to stay on the ground, it's simply what our bodies are built for. Still. I felt the need to overcome my body. I would be more than my name or my personal reputation. All I needed was enough confidence to not know what I was doing and still do it. I couldn't stay calm anymore. With an adrenaline-fueled kick, I sent myself flying. With an attempt at an acrobatic twirl, I brought my legs around. They collided with a stone wall and I immediately sprung off of it and down toward a building closer to the ground. I didn't quite know where I was going. I simply played it by instinct and hoped that my knee-jerk reactions would be too much for the railgun to predict. I heard that dreadful sound again and threw myself down the street. I was growing farther from the crystal now, but I had a plan. 
I grabbed an antenna on the roof of a building and screamed as my shoulders took the full force of the sudden stop. Within seconds, I had repositioned myself and went flying directly at the ship. It was a straight shot, and if I closed the gap, I could land a clean hit or two. For the first time in months, I began to feel true faith in myself. My actions, whether that of justice or an animal trying to survive, would carve a lasting effect on both my life and that of my foe. The railgun fired. I felt a rush of wind as the shell soared right past me, and my heart broke in two. The blast, though it didn't hit me, ruined my trajectory. I began to tumble in a state of freefall, omnidirectional freefall it seemed, as I couldn't tell sky from earth with how violently I flipped and rolled through the air. Was this it? Would I now fly off into space and cease to exist? I was very quickly forced to come to terms with the fact of my death when I felt a sudden impact. Several small blades pierced my back, and my head was dashed into something that fractured beneath it with a loud crunch. I felt unconsciousness wash over me, but brushed it away in a panic. Breathing in ragged, feral gasps, I took stock of the situation. I had been launched through the large glass window of an office building, through the ceiling, and into a ventilation shaft. This wasn't good at all. I slowly pushed myself to the floor of the office, then crawled over to the edge. I saw the crystal off in the distance. I watched it for a few minutes, waiting for it to fire again and show me where its attention was focused. After a while, it destroyed some department store. Then, it targeted a bank. Next, a high-rise. I laughed, as I realized that I was now presumed dead. The barrage of shots now held no focus other than random destruction. To think that they would fall victim to that same fallacy which I so detested within myself this was simply too fortunate for me not to capitalize on it. I picked up a file cabinet and bashed out the rest of the glass on the window I had entered through, then positioned myself carefully on the ceiling. This is going to be perfect. I motioned delicately with my feet, pushing off of the ceiling. This time my speed would be minimal. I was dead, after all and I didn't want my ghostly visage to unnerve my good killer until it was too late for them to fight back. So, I floated down toward that crystal slowly and silently. As I closed it, I saw that it was about a hundred feet long and relatively circular. I landed softly on my hands, and quickly grew acclimated to the crystal surface. I probed the surface, looking for some sort of opening. I found it rather quickly. Whatever invisibility coated this crystal had faded away in one spot, which happened to reveal a large hatch. I went to open it, and it popped wide open with a gentle pull. Most suspicious thing I've seen since the last time I walked down the dark alley, but I couldn't pass up any opportunities from here on out. I pulled myself inside, and found myself in a small room. There was a massive bug near a control panel. It was something like an overgrown praying mantis, but infinitely more monstrous. Hey, I began, not really knowing how to proceed. Did you leave that door open for me? I didn't know you cared. The bug raised its pincers and flew at me. I was unsurprised and raised an arm to guard myself. It dug deep into the flesh of my arm. I reached back with my other hand and brought the knife around in a quick slash. The powerful motion sent me into a mid-air pirouette, and I felt those accursed claws slice up my legs. 
I pushed off of the ceiling with my free hand and came down upon the creature, but it dodged too quickly and I slammed meaninglessly against the ground. I began to realize that the creature was much better at fighting without gravity than me. It couldn't finish me off with the railgun, but it was confident in fighting me one on one. I thought of a potential gambit. I threw away my knife and flailed around wildly, making a big show of hitting my head on the ceiling. After that, I made sure to guard my head and move a lot more slowly. My brain was a vital organ, so I was revealing an actual weakness of mine. But just maybe... The mantis soared for my head, claws extended for my eyes. I watched it draw closer, then tilted my head downward. With both arms, I reached behind the mantis, drawing it forward and crushing its body between my hands and my skull. Insect blood covered my face, and I felt one of its claws feebly scratch at my hair, but I brushed off the viscera and stomped on it a few more times for good measure. Now that my enemy was nothing more than a stain on the floor, I wasn't quite sure what to do. Then... A smile creeped onto my face as I realized what potential I now held. I turned to the puddle and said, Now that your ride is mine, I think I'll see if you've got any friends. I'm just dying to meet them. Hey, you. Yeah, you. The stupid-looking attorney with your head buried in your paperwork. I'd like you to come with me. No, none of that yes boss crap. We won't be needing such formalities anymore. Just get out of that chair and follow me. There's something I need to show you in the archives. All right, let's have a look here. Adrian, your profile says you're agnostic. I take that to mean you don't follow any particular faith, but you would be willing if one of them was proven right. Yes, that's very interesting. Yes, I did come here just to debate theology with you. But that's not all there is to it. I want you to give me a chance. All I want is for you to hear me out, got it? Just listen to what I have to say. You can call me crazy, you can walk away from all of this. Or you can take one little measure to better yourself. I should let you know I do have a lot of power within and beyond this company. If you play your cards right, you'll find yourself among the elite. If you don't, well, things would naturally become a lot less comfortable for both of us. I really hope you'll make the right choice. Understood? I said... Do you understand me? Do you comprehend the words which I am speaking with my mouth? If not, let me rephrase. Pinchiconia! No eres estupido! No hace falta miedo, amor. You get what I'm trying to say, right? I can see it in your eyes, Adrian. You're going to be reasonable with me, aren't you? Ah. Uh. Of course you are. <laughs> I shouldn't have been so worried there. I almost lost my composure for a minute. Let me show you the scriptures. As you can see, there are celestial beings. As crystals do we perceive them, and as insects do they perceive us. They will come and they will destroy us all. They are far too powerful to resist. They can annihilate whole cities and drive the citizens mad, and without lifting a finger to strike at us directly. Still, there is one path to salvation, one way in which we can pull the wool over their eyes. We must decide our fate, and show them that they cannot do so for us. You say you'd worship a god if it ever came down and revealed itself, but these gods know no love. They do not deserve it. So, what will you do now? 
You know of the power which these beings hold. Will you reject them and their pitiful teachings, or grasp tightly to whatever hope they may offer? Yes, oh yes, that is exactly what I hoped you'd say. Oh, Adrian, I bid you welcome to the Order of Ubermensch. Now, there is a little <laughs> initiation ritual that must be observed. Have you ever learned our philosophy here at Ubermensch Incorporated? That's quite right, Adrian. Through innovation we aim to decide our own fate. With the power of our minds we can build ourselves a future. This is something I've been wanting to use for a long, long time. You see this, Adrian? It's a cute little hammer. I keep this on me wherever I go to remind me that I am, at heart, a craftsman. With this hammer, I build bridges and roads to the only truth we will ever know. Now, be a good little acolyte for me, and hold still. I'm going to forge you into a very precious item indeed. My eyes! Ah, those damn fingernails. Why would you do such a thing to me? I simply wanted to strike and strike your precious little head until your brain turned from a sharp little thorn in my side to a useless lump of fat and fluids. That is your ultimate fate. Don't run from it, little Adrian. You must decide your own fate. Now, Adrian, the gods of despair and death are upon us. Our people are lost to madness. There is only one way out from this living hell, and it is me. 